NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! As an adult, don't we all miss spring break? Nothing like taking a week off from all your responsibilities. Well, here's the next best thing for adults, a spring break from house payments. SaveWithConrad.com can help you get rid of all your credit card debt, just like that. We're routinely helping our listeners save five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but check this out. No house payments for two months at SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you are listening to Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Connie. Good to see you. You look good today, all dressed in your traditional black. Yes, sir. The, the man in black. I like you it. You wore more black than Johnny Cash. Well, you know, here's the deal. If you have a uniform, why not let it be a, a comfortable black t-shirt? That's what I always right. say. Look at you rocking your Eagles 50 years. So the Eagles, your favorite band? Yeah. Yeah. My dad's By too. Far. Yeah. The Eagles and, uh, Fleetwood Mac. Oh yeah. I would, I would, uh, I would quit the wrestling business and go to go on the road with Fleetwood Mac. If Stevie Nicks, if I was her guy, I'd ch- check it all in. I mean, 270, two people in their seventies hanging. I could do that with her. You know, we could, we could make sure we signal boost this message and let her know you're, you're a buyer. <laughs> you're interested. I'm a buyer. I just think she's uh, amazing. So, but any, any clue, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, but I'm, everything else is good. You know, uh, it's a lot, we had a lot of travel last couple of weeks. You know, I was thinking I, you and I were talking off air that I was gone. Like, oh, hell 10, 10 days. days. Yeah. Yeah. We and, wound up uh, doing a, a best of last week where we shared some bonus content from adfreeshows.com because I kind of forgot, Hey man, live rampage, live dynamite pay-per-view yeah. another dynamite. Like. That's a, that's a long travel week for you. Yeah. And it's, of course, living here in Florida, at, you know, part-time anyway, uh, but here in Florida and California is a hall. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, people can say what they want, but that's a, that's a long ass trip. And with my, my ankle, uh, as it is, the more I fly, the more painful it gets because it's like any other flight, any, any other human, you're, uh. You, you find yourself, your feet swell, your hands swell. It's just normal flying shit. But when you got a bad ankle and you're trying to get this thing, this wound to close and not open, uh, it's a, it's a challenging. So I'm, uh, we don't have any more of those bad trips right now. Uh, they got, you know, I, I did not make uh, Wichita. So therefore I won't be on rampage this Friday night. You but, mean Winnipeg, uh, Winnipeg. What'd I say? Wichita. Oh, I, I, Wichita I go. <laughs> Listen up, Raphael. Book us to Wichita and yeah. JR will be there. Home of the wheat shockers. Uh so anyhow, uh I'm I'm uh enjoying this week off, so to speak. I've got Good. a lot of things to do. Good for you. You know, the the work the stuff that you do in your real life doesn't stop. No. Big time TV personality, my ass. I still gotta get a haircut today. I still gotta uh, go to the pharmacy. I don't know. I got something else on my list of things to do today, but it's rainy here. It's bad. It's, there's not anybody on the beach today. It's very unusual that there's no one on the beach because normally, even when it rains, <coughs> we get the occasional joggers, right? They just dress accordingly or just dress in shorts with the hide go with the towel, as they say in the country. So, uh, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to enjoy this week. It was tiring, Connor. I got to tell you, it was. Those are long ass flights, man. And there was no directs, not any, the direct I got was from Atlanta to da- to, uh, Jacksonville. And that took about an hour. So it's tough, man. I don't <laughs> see how some of these guys, I don't say I did it back in the day when I was just getting in the business, making no money and driving everywhere. That's, that's part of the business. I don't think some people can ever fully understand the challenges there, uh, unless you have a job where you're driving for a living, right? In some shape, form or fashion, you're in your vehicle going to work. So that's all it was. We just got in our cars, went to work. So it's crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. My building's getting ready to start a new, uh, we had to all pay 40 grand for our new windows and 
assessment from the HOA board. So, uh, what er, everybody who lives there had to cough up 40 grand. The ones who lived on the higher floors coughed up more. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 40 G's. And, uh, so guess what I did? I wrote them a check. Yeah, of course you did. They had a payment plan, right? I'm thinking I, I'm not going to get involved in a payment plan for new windows. No, but the windows will be safer and they'll be, they're all updated, all state of the art, all that bullshit safety first. So that's where we are. So that's what we get. That's what you get here. I got to deal with that this week. So I'll have plenty of little projects, do little honey do's. I just don't have a honey to instruct me on how to do them. Well, uh, you are accepting applications now on Twitter at JR's BBQ. If you are looking to be JR's uh, honey, uh, he is, uh, <laughs> he has a position for you at JR's yeah. BBQ. Hey, listen, we're yeah. going to have a lot of fun. Our topic today is we celebrate 316. It's yeah. March 16th. As you're listening is stone colds, 1999. It is going to be a blast. But before we talk about that, we got two things we should touch on. Uh, one is something kind of fun. One is something kind of not so fun. Let's do some fun yeah. first. The NCAA tournament is here. You and I love college football. This is college basketball time. Of course it got kicked off this past Tuesday. Uh, and then there's a couple of games yesterday, but today, uh, man, it's starting. It's live. It's ready. Alabama is coming in uh, ranked number one. I can't believe that's a thing. Uh, and they're going to be playing today. And there's just a whole host of other games. What do you expect this, uh, this tournament? Uh, I like Alabama's chances. I watched them play this week. They got a lot of great talent. They're deep or it seems to me like they're deep. Uh, but I don't, I think it's kind of half ass wide open. I know Alabama's an overall number one seed. So, uh, it's, it's, it's not as clear cut as the women's side, right? South Carolina is the hands down favorite to win that whole thing. And so I, I heard some experts, I use that term lightly that said, they're gamblers, gambler side on T on ESPN. I think it was, uh, they're going to take South Carolina versus the field is going to be their bet. Mm. So that's an interesting, interesting way of looking at it. But anyhow, I, I like Alabama's chances. Uh, I don't, I'm just trying to think in my head, Conrad, what other team is potentially very dominant that could, could get on a roll. The, the issue about both these March tournaments. Males or the females is who gets hot at the right time. There you go. It's all about role. Who got, who got on the roll? Who, who went cold? You know, uh, the, the only way that South Carolina could lose is that they can't find the basket and they can't hit, they can't make a shot. Right. I don't, I don't see that happening. <laughs> so, uh, but on the men's side, you know, Hey, Alabama's got a good chance as anybody. They're long, they're lean, they're athletic, they run well. So, uh, it should be fun. It'd be a fun week of TV. At least for me being home this week, I'll be able to enjoy some quality sports. Well, of course, we also saw the uh, sec tournament this past weekend came down to uh, Texas A and M and Alabama, Alabama gets the W there. Probably yeah. doesn't make you upset to see Texas A and M take a L every now and again. Does it? No, I don't mind seeing Texas losing anything they do because <laughs> I'm an Oki. Yeah, I'm hard headed and stubborn, uh, and I might not be right, but you know, that's my, that's my, uh, my, that's my jam Conrad. It's my jam. Uh, but, uh, I, I didn't have, I didn't have a problem when didn't uh, Texas lose to Kansas. Yeah, I believe that's right. Yeah. Kansas is coming in highly ranked in this tournament. You know, there's all these different fields of course. And Kansas also comes in with a number one ranking as well as uh, Purdue and, and I think Houston. So listen, yeah. it, it's should be a lot of fun. Uh, it, well, Thursday is as you're listening to this, there's going to be a lot of great basketball. We appreciate you guys spending time with us today and listening to us ramble on about one of our favorite subjects, Stone Cold Steve Austin in 1999. But before we talk about him, we should address some sad news in our little yeah. wrestling world. Uh, our great close personal friend, Arn Anderson has suffered a tragedy that boy, nobody ever plans or expects. He lost his oldest son, Barrett. Uh, of course they're the real life Lundy family. And you see, if you're watching on YouTube, Brock, who we've seen on AEW, his lovely wife, uh, Aaron. And the first time I met Arn Anderson, he said, you know, I'm weird. I said, how, how, what do you mean? You're weird. 
And he goes, I live in the same town in the same house, married to the same woman this whole time, but continuously employed in wrestling throughout the entire run. And I, that, that makes that family and that circumstance a little unique, but yeah. boy, this tragedy is not something anybody would have ever hoped for. As I understand it, uh, Barrett was only 37 years old and yes. amazing whew, gone way too soon, man. Those of us that had children can only sh- shudder at the thought that that could happen to us. Yeah. And the sad irony of that is it can happen to us. Uh, putting increased value on your family and the time you spend with them and the love you share with them should be a daily occurrence. And, uh, I feel so bad for, for Arn. He's a, he's a big, he's, he's, a, he's still a human. He's a big, tough guy. One of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Uh, and, but golly, man, losing a child. Yeah. 37 or not. It don't matter. He's still going to always be your baby and he's and his oldest son. And I, and I like, uh, as far as a wrestler is concerned, I think that the, the other son has uh, some upside. I really do. Yeah. Uh, wrestling heel. And, uh, so we'll see how that style still plays out in the future in the, in the wrestling business, but I feel badly for Arn. He's got so many friends. I'm sure he's been overwhelmed with Twitter, uh, Twitter correspondence, however, how, how you say that, uh, but he's one of the most popular guys in wrestling. He's funny, reliable, uh, great skills. He was a natural heel natural. So, uh, but I, so I feel so badly for him right now. I just can't imagine what he's going through. Can't imagine it. I don't even want to, I don't even want to go there. Yeah. Just put myself in his place. It's just so sad and debilitating. And, uh, so all we can do is show him our love and our support and, and hope he moves on as quickly as humanly possible. And that's all up to the individual. So I don't know that you ever get over it. I don't think you do. You know, uh, unfortunately it's something that my new family, I guess you'd call it dealt with 10 years ago this month when Reed flair passed away. And, uh, that's just awful, man. To think about two former best friends like that, Rick and Arn, both losing their sons. Like that's not something you ever want to have in common with anybody. And, you know, it sounds a little cliche, but certainly our thoughts and prayers, uh, go out to, to Marty and Aaron and Brock and the whole family. You know, the, I know we talk a lot about wrestling on this show, but that's not wrestling and it's real life. But I felt like we should probably mention it right at the top of the show. Oh, I agree. I agree. I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did. God bless Arn and his family. Well, listen, man, I wish I had some sort of slick transition. My, my word factory sort of shuts down in times like these. Cause I don't really know what to say. Uh, but yeah. I do know that, that I'm excited that you and I get a chance to talk about something that we loved so damn much. You were there riding shotgun for all of it. Stone cold, Steve Austin and his 1999 When 1998 ends, Austin is on a bit of a hiatus from TV after defeating the undertaker in a buried alive match at rock bottom. And I think it's because, uh, he, uh, had been running hard in 1998 and probably had some bumps and bruises, maybe needed a little day off here or there. And his return to television takes place in 98, but it airs in 99. You will talk about a return, maybe the most legendary pop in WWE history. The glass shatters in Worcester mass when out comes stone cold, Steve Austin to hit the rock with a chair and help mankind win his first ever WWF world title. I mean, the pop was deafening. I've heard people who were there say the building felt like it was shaking. What do you remember about this magical moment on Monday night? Raw, a tape draw of all things. Yeah. I remember watching it at home. I was uh, on one of my Bell's palsy, uh, sabbaticals. So I was there in spirit, right? Uh, you know, having Foley win the title and I didn't get to call that after all, our history was, uh, disappointing, uh, to not be there when Steve came out was disappointing, but you know, I was sick and, uh, I had to heal. So I think things like that were motivational to me that I had to get my ass back to work and 
but you get into a, kind of a jackpot, Conrad, because there's no, there's no easy fix for this Bill's palsy. Right. You're waiting for ner- you're waiting for nerves to regenerate, and uh, from someone that's had it three times, uh, you know, it's uh, it's daunting, as we say. So, uh, but I I, w- I miss that. But it was a hell of a night of television. I'll tell you that right now. Such a fantastic moment, and of course. Austin returning is going to be a thorn in the side of Mr. McMahon. That story is just going to pick right up where it left off. Um, did you think that that story was going to have the legs that it did? I can see how a lot of people would think, you know, this will be good for a pay-per-view or 30 or maybe 60 or 90 day run, but that rivalry, man, it just continued and it never got old. Like somehow we, we found a way for it to be interesting week in, week out. It's almost reminiscent of what they used to do. If you listen to Jeff Jarrett and talk about what they did in Memphis where, Hey, we're, we're wrestling in big arenas in front of the same fans every single week. We've got to find a way to add a new wrinkle to the story for what are Dundee and Lawler going to do this week. Well, you're sort of doing that again here and it doesn't have the sense of sameness. Fans just can't get enough of these two incredible performers, a heel, Mr. McMahon. And the hotter than ever white meat baby face, if you will, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah, it was uh two great performers that were challenged and compelled to keep their material fresh. All traveling the same road to get to the same destination. But the, the stops along the journey had to be kept fresh and uh they keep the edge on and all those things. So uh it's still Austin versus the establishment always. That was always the story. And, uh, you know, I've said this, uh, on one of my books, I think it might've been the under the black hat. I, I believe that Vince was the greatest heel in the attitude era. Yeah. And uh, I'll stick with that story. And of course in Austin, it just helped propel Austin to new heights. And that's another way you judge how effective McMahon was as a heel is how over Stone Cold got, uh, and, and was cause that it went hand in hand. You can't have one's not going to get over and the other's going to fall flat. It's not going to work that way. They're going to affect each other in the various ways. But, uh, I thought it was, uh, they were great and they kept it fresh and they were challenged. They challenged themselves to keep it fresh. So, uh, I, I was a big fan of that whole era, as you can imagine, cause it's just it, we, we, we put the excitement back in things. You know, I go, I watch stuff. Somebody sent me something on Twitter the other day, by the way, I'm on Twitter at J R S B B Q. If you care to enjoy and uh, join us, uh, on that medium, uh, I, I, I was watching a clip of an Austin entrance or something. I think an entrance. I, and I forgot how many signs and posters were in the crowd. It's crazy. My God, it was wall to wall. And so if you make a commitment just to come to wrestling and park and pay for parking and eat a $10 hot dog or whatever the hell it is, you know, uh, it's, uh, that's commitment and to draw those signs and make those signs that a lot of them had a lot of effort put into them. And then they, and to bring them from home to the event, that's commitment. And so that was how people showed their support to this whole storyline. And especially for Steve. Right. Well, I'll tell you, this is a, a, a roughly a year now, you know, let's remember this is January here of uh, 1999 and it was January of 98 when the whole Mike Tyson thing started. So yeah. Mr. McMahon versus stone cold has been cruising along here for, you know, over a year. If you go back to September of 97 and count the stoner and Boy, we really turned the volume up because there's going to be a corporate rumble with DX and the corporation. This all happens on Monday night raw and the winner is going to have the 30th spot in the actual Royal rumble and stone cold actually helps eliminate Vince McMahon. China wins. So that means China's coming in at number 30 for the rumble but it makes stone cold and Vince number one and number two to enter the rumble, man, this is fun storytelling. And, yeah. uh, Vince is even going to put a hundred thousand dollar bounty on Steve's head to have him eliminated. 
And when I think about bounties, I think about that, that old classic promo from Harley race, begging people to take the money to take out flair. And here we are now, you know, <laughs> what's old is new again. Vince is doing it for stone cold. This is good stuff. The bounty angle and, and the scenario was so used, so used throughout every territory. Yes. Every wrestling territory at some point in time, their star baby face, uh, was backed into a corner by the evil heel or the evil heel manager. And, uh, a bounty was placed on their head. It's an easy story to understand. It's easy to explain. It's easy to react to. And, uh, so, uh, the stories, those guys have stayed in, in, intertwined. I mean, golly, I, I didn't know how it was going to work out with them having to, uh, be number one and number two in the rumble match. Uh, I was concerned that how, can they sustain it very long and, you know, this is limited what he could do, but, but what he did, he did really, really well, but there just wasn't a long grocery list on his repertoire. So it was, a. Uh, it was interesting to see. It's interesting to see how they, they, so in other words, they came back and reinserted Austin and McMahon. Yep. They just put them in number one and number two. Yep. Smart booking. Well, before we I'm get sure, there, I'm sure, I'm sure that's a Pat Patterson thing, Connie. I'm sorry. Uh, Patterson is so good at that stuff. I thought about him a lot last week when we were in, uh, San Francisco, his old stomping grounds. Yeah. Well, that car, that cat palace is a dump. <laughs> oh my God. I'm serious. It's just, uh, you know, I, I respect it. And I was really glad we played there two nights, but boy, it's, uh, it's, it's only too curt course here, but it's essentially outgrown its usefulness. Right. I don't, I don't know the last time I had a coat of paint on it. For example, just, it just was, uh, it just was just, it was not a good facility, but we had fun and we had decent crowds. And I thought to broadcast a match in the cow palace was a pretty cool deal. I, I like that kind of stuff. So it just wasn't the building. I'd want to go to regularly. That's all. Hey, listen, since we're talking about current stuff, let's do this as a sidebar. You know, you've had the uh, opportunity to call a lot of Iron Man matches in your day. For yep. whatever reason, you weren't on the call for Brian Danielson and MJF, but I'm sure you got a chance to see it. What'd you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I, I really take my good old black hat off to both those guys. Uh, they told a great story. They kept connecting the dots. And that's the art of great storytelling. You don't have any interruptions in service like you do on cable TV sometimes. Right. Uh, so, uh, I, no, I, I thought it was fantastic. I, I uh, uh, MJF exceeded my expectations in that match. I agree. Uh, he worked his ass off. He got, he got himself in great shape. He was prepared. And, uh, I, I, it's interesting this week, uh, was his bar? What's a rebar mitzvah? That's right. So I'll be watching that on my tube in my, on my kit from my couch. We, uh, we should at least acknowledge the, uh, they, the bottom line, Connor, the match was great. Uh, Brian Danielson deserves a tremendous amount of credit for being the captain of that match I Agree. and making sure that he fed MJF with material, physical material, verbal material, emotional material to sustain the contest. It takes a team effort without question. And I thought those guys scored uh, big time because again, you get to just, just remember the common sense aspect of these things. They're going to go an hour. We knew that. Yeah. And, and Connie, they, people had already seen when I say everything, I mean, pretty damn much everything. So how do you follow that? and invest your hour of, of the audience's time and the, and, but I see nothing but good stuff, uh, feedback online about that match. And, and I just thought it was excellent. I really did. I'm proud of those guys. And, uh, it gave me confidence that uh, we have, we haven't seen nearly the best of the champion. He's still going to get better. He's young. He's 26. Uh, so I think he's going to do, I think he's 26. He's 26. He's, yeah. Yeah. He's going to be fine. He's, he's going to be. I think that should relieve the doubt if there are, was any to where he's more than just a great mouthpiece. Yes. He, we know he's a great talker. Yes. 
but we saw he had another side of him, athletic side of him. That was very, very impressed with. And what, what more can you say about, uh, uh, Brian Danielson, Daniel, yeah. Brian Danielson, for God's sakes. I mean, he's, we say this on television and I know part of it's hype that he's the best wrestler, he is. pure pro wrestler in the world. I think he is. He has been for a long time. Yeah. So, uh, in any event, I'm glad you asked me that question because we missed last week because of travel issues. I'm, I'm in California with no facility to record. And, uh, but anyway, uh, it was good. It was a hell of a, hell of a match. I'm proud of both those guys. Uh, it was physical, good story. Like I said, you got to connect the dots, right? And those, those two guys connected the dots as well as anybody uh, could in that environment. Listen, I don't want to get, uh, get any of us in trouble here, but I can't help, but ask, cause you have, uh, run some of the most prolific groups of, uh, talent relations, if you will, and locker rooms and rosters. And, and you've seen a lot of guys mature and grow and get better and learn from their mistakes, et cetera, et cetera. All those cliches. I'm just wondering, hypothetically, did you think MJF went too far with, uh, the kid and the drink? Was it a teachable moment? I mean, we don't I, have to necessarily talk about that incident in particular, if you're not comfortable with it, but I know that. Oh, I don't, it, I think he just, it was, a, it was a, just a, a reaction. I think it was instinctual or to him. He, 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 he max fa- fancies himself as he should, by the way, as a heel. Yes. Now, Cornette would say, I'm a heel. God damn it. Uh, so I, I just think he, he took it too far. Yeah. You don't do that. And I think he understands that now. And, uh, but he had a, it's just an emotional reaction and you got to, he's surrounded by people that don't like him. Right. And he's, you know, there's a lot of tension and pressure in that, in that situation that you put yourself in, but you know, you, you don't want to have it any other way if you're a heel. Right. But, but throwing a, that, uh, beverage in that kid's face too far, too far. He shouldn't do it. And he just reacted. He right. reacted and he reacted in a negative way. He made the wrong choice, but it, to me, it didn't take away from the match. No, uh, I, after the fact, it becomes more of an issue because like right now, you and I are talking about it. Uh, but no, I, I, I think it was just a rea- it's, it's a natural heel reaction that got the best of max. Well, let's talk about, you know, when we're talking about, did it go too far? The other thing that was at least discussed was. Did Hangman Adam Page and John Moxley go too far? There's a certain uh, sentiment that people thought that, hey, they took quote unquote hardcore too far. Other folks say, hey, this is much ado about nothing. Uh, there's a place for that in wrestling. Even Ric Flair said, hey, no, hardcore wrestling has its place. You just want you don't want to do it every week. You were there. What do you think? Well, I loved it. I did too. Uh, because I understand the concept of a Texas death match. Uh, they're not pretty, right? They're going to be sensationalized. You got all carte blanche to use all these toys, shall we say? So uh, for what it was, how it was booked, it delivered exactly what it needed to deliver. Was it coarse and graphic and, and, uh, you know, compelling. Yep. Sure was. But I didn't think it would be anything else, especially with Moxley leading the way. And he knew that blood was going to blood in a Texas death match is, is like peanut butter and jelly. So, uh, it just goes together. Well said. So no, I don't, it didn't bother me, Connie. I didn't, it, I thought those guys worked their ass off. The first thing I've always looked back at is effort and desire. Did you give me the effort and the, uh, with the desire that was noticeable and sellable and relatable? I'd say this guy's did all three of those things. Uh, it was really, it was really good in that regard based on what it was booked to, to be. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, anything but a, a, a fight street right. fight type thing. Yes. Stuff that if you did it outside the building, you'd be arrested for. Right. So I, I had no problem with it. I'm, I'm with you on that one. I thought that you guys, I thought they delivered really well. And I, the only thing I would have done differently is have me call it <laughs> says the ego maniac. 
Well, I'll tell you what, they, uh, they, they gave us what was advertised. And, yeah. and speaking of that, somebody who will always give you what's advertised. How about spring has sprung and our friends at manscaped the leaders in below the waist grooming have the best tools for some spring cleaning in your pants. Trust me, your confidence will be blooming like the flowers. Look your best this spring and join the other 8 million men who trust manscaped. Use the code Jim Ross to get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Manscaped is here to change the way that fellas take care of themselves and the way we groom ourselves with the performance package 4.0 inside this ball care bundle. You'll find the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, the crop preserver, ball deodorant, crop reviver, toner, performance boxer briefs, and a shed travel bag, all to hold your goodies. And the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer is an elite electric trimmer that provides proprietary advanced skin safe technology. You see, this trimmer is designed to trim hair on loose skin. Your balls might look like punching bags, but you don't need to treat them like one. And if you've been using something else and maybe the bathroom looked like CSI Oklahoma after you don't have to anymore. Lawnmower 4.0 is also waterproofed and it's equipped with an led light. So you can trim your bag in the dark or in the shower. Have you ever met somebody who finds nose hairs attractive? Probably not. And that's why Jim and I are rocking the weed whacker nose and ear hair trimmer. I used mine last night in my recliner in my den. Everybody was tickled to see me doing that. And by the way, it also has proprietary skin safe technology it means it's not going to hurt your little delicate ear and nose holes. How about the ball deodorant It's Tony Schiavone's favorite little known fact. WCW went out of business because no one could sit near Tony Schiavone. His <laughs> balls were that smelly. Once I got him ball deodorant, the phone call came. Tony Khan put it back on TV. That's what happened. It changed his life. It could do it for you too. I only wish I had gotten Eric Bischoff, the crop reviver ball toner. When he went back to work with Vince, had I done that, maybe it would have lasted a little longer, but if anybody's listening, Mr. Bischoff is using that ball toner. He's ready. If you purchase now, you'll get two free gifts. You get the performance boxer briefs and Jim Ross's real deal. Favorite shed travel bag. He uses right. this every time he travels to this day. It's fantastic. And it's free. You save 20% off and you get free shipping. When you use the promo code Jim Ross at manscaped.com, that's 20% off and free shipping with the code Jim Ross at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. They will. I look what I got this week. Uh, oh, look at there. Are you ready? Think? You're ready for it. The, the weed whacker. I got it in the mail. It's the nice best surprise. man. Nice surprise from uh, our friends at manscaped next week. I yeah, think I'm, we need to have you I'm, on air. Just use it for us. Show us what's up. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. Conrad. Manscaped.com 20% off plus free shipping. Just use our promo code Jim Ross. Hey, so listen, let's get back to Austin and, uh, McMahon. Uh, there's going to be a lot of Gaga around the old arrowhead pond, the former home of WrestleMania 12. It winds up where Austin gets attacked in the, uh, in the locker room or the bathroom. Rather the corporation comes after him. And he gets carried out on a stretcher and he's driven away in an ambulance. And Vince is going to come out later and sit with uh, Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler at the announce table. And shortly after we would see the undertaker and the ministry of darkness abduct Mabel and put him in the back of a hearse in the parking lot. It's 1999 folks. Yeah. Then an ambulance arrives, but it's Austin driving it himself. And he comes storming down to the ring. Austin's going to eliminate Ken Shamrock, Billy Gunn, Test, China, Big Boss Man. And then, of course, The Rock comes out and distracts Steve. And that leads to Vince throwing him out and winning the Rumble. And this is maybe not the most well remembered Rumble, but uh, what a story. An ambulance. I mean, we had Austin drive all kinds of silliness, but now yeah. leaves in an ambulance and drives it back. Yeah, he's he likes driving things. Yeah. <laughs> Zamboni. Did he do the Zamboni? He did. Yeah. Cause milk of many was an angle steel. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, Steve had skills. Yes, he did. He could drive. He could drive. If he got, he put a start. If he can start it, find getting the gear shift, he can drive it. Uh, it was just unique what he did and what he could do, what he wanted to do. So, cause Austin had a big hand in all this creative, 
uh, you know, he's either going to approve it or disapprove it. And the only downside to that is sometimes some talents disapprove a storyline or uh, something along these lines that we're talking about. They don't have a better idea for it. And, uh, but Steve always had ideas seemed to me like, so, uh, he he was just, he's very creative in that regard and nobody cared more about getting Steve over than Steve. Right. As it should be. Right. Listen, we, uh, we've talked about some great Royal rumbles here on the show before. I think a lot of folks listening to this hold 92 in high regard. I hold 97 in high regard. You and I've recently uh, here on the program talked about 98, but this 99 Royal rumble, it does feel like maybe there's too much of the quote unquote Gaga. We got hearses and ambulances and Vince McMahon wins the thing, uh, in hindsight, or at the time, did you think, man, maybe we're doing too much of this guy guy, or is it something you don't even really it's working and you're getting reactions. So let's just do more of it. When you look up and see the, what the TV ratings are, right. And you look up in the crowd and see no empty seats. You kind of want to believe this is good stuff, right? It's still selling tickets. There's still an interest in it. We have a full house and, uh, anybody that takes sellouts and full houses for granted, uh, especially in today's economy are, uh, are following the wrong trail. So I, I think this proof was it basically all statistic, statistical, if that's a word. Uh, and you know, it was just there. You see, you see the result. Hey, that's God dang. There's a lot of people here. And like I said earlier about those signs, you know, until you, re- until you recall it. And then there's a lot of fans that listen to our show that weren't uh, around to listen to or to see the attitude era and remember those signs there, there there's been nothing like it before or, or since quite frankly. So I noticed on, uh, what was it? Uh, something I watched from WWE the other day. So it was either raw or SmackDown, but I don't normally watch SmackDown very regularly should, but I don't, uh, but anyway, the, uh, uh, there's, there's more signs popping up and I think that's a good deal. Let's, uh, let's also talk about the next night. We got Shawn Michaels and, uh, he's going to be the, um, WWF commissioner and he's able to book Austin in the main event at WrestleMania, even after Vince won, because Vince of course gives up the title shot. So rightfully it goes to the runner up and Michael's also puts together Austin versus McMahon for St. Valentine's day massacre. It's a steel cage match at this point, you guys have, you know, finally toppled nitro after the historic 83, three weeks in a row. Uh, and what, what, what actually puts you over the, the hump there is Austin and McMahon in a main event on Monday night raw. Well, that was the prior April here. We are now in February, the following year, we're going to try it on pay-per-view in a steel cage. Was there any hesitant? Was Vince hesitant to put himself in this spot? Is everyone, oh, he, lo- he loved it. Conrad. He loved it. Okay. He's living his dream. Yes. He always wanted to be a wrestler and his, and, and his dad, uh, Vincent J McMahon. Uh, wouldn't have anything. He wouldn't, wouldn't even consider it. So that's kind of where that was. Uh, but no, he loved that kind of stuff. He liked living on the edge and living dangerously. I think, uh, I think most people would agree that that's accurate and fair. So, uh, but the steel cage guarantees blood to see McMahon and or Austin bleed was going to sell pay-per-views quite frankly, just to be blunt about it. That's kind of where I was in that deal. Well, it's it, the gimmicks good. The gimmicks old established, et cetera, et cetera. And most people are going to say that I've never been to a cage match or somebody didn't bleed. Right. And, and that sounds like, well, there's gotta be a better reason than that. Jr. Well, there may be, I don't know it. I just know what the fans were expecting violence and, and destruction and physicality. And that's what you're going to get from an Austin McMahon match. Cause that Vince only knew how to street fights type stuff, take bumps, get his ass whipped and then cheat to regain the advantage. Always stack the deck, typical heel things. And he did them very well. 
In a special Raw at the Sky Dome, Austin is going to wrestle the corporation in a gauntlet match, which leads to Vince pinning Austin to build for the upcoming pay per view. Did you ever think Austin got hurt by losing to Vince? No. no. Gosh, no. Yeah. Not at all. I thought it was match made in hell in a good way. Uh, that's what a, that's just, it's what a heel should do. He was winning by hook or crook. And so I don't think it hurt Steve whatsoever. And let me tell you something. If Steve had not as much influence as Steve had on his own creative, if he had not been on board with the finish, we wouldn't have done it. Right. Pretty similar. Would it lost him like that? He, he did, or he wouldn't have done it. And I don't, I don't know if that makes him arrogant or whatever. It doesn't to me because he knew how to book his character better than anybody else. And, uh, he lived that character. The character was him only as he would say, well, the volume turned up. So, uh, I, uh, I don't think, was, I think any of those losses were not important. I've heard criticisms of, of Austin in that era where he could, he knew what his character would do and wouldn't do. Right. But he wasn't necessarily someone who could come up with a different idea. So the criticism I heard would be perhaps someone would maybe a writer or an assistant or some such would bring him over something and say, Hey, here's what we're thinking. And he might not be thrilled with it and say, Hey, this sucks. I don't want to do this, but there wasn't a, Hey, what if we did this? Was that a challenge that was unique to Austin? Were other guys prone to saying, Hey, what if we tried this or, or was this really not unique for top guys? They knew what they would do or not do, or their character would do or not do, but they weren't necessarily just a fountain of ideas. I'd say, uh, it was typical. Okay. Most, most top guys, uh, if you ask Slayer about something like this, this question. Uh, you know, he's going to tell you that, uh, uh, it, it all depends on the booking and it all, de- everything's success depends on your feel for, and your execution. Uh, so, uh, you know, but I don't know that nature was, was, a he could book his own stuff very well. It was historic what he did and how long he lasted on top, uh, still amazes me. It's a, it's a tremendous tribute to Rick, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it, these are stage shows, man. You know, I don't know that you're supposed to go, well, I'll, well, I'll do this for the first match. And then, uh, then uh, here's an idea for the third match or whatever. That just don't happen. Right. Guys just don't. And, and I don't know if Steve was any different, you know, quite frankly, uh, at least that, that's my experience. All those years in the territories and the Watts days, and the WCW days, et cetera, et cetera. Working for corny there in OVW some which I actually enjoyed a lot. So, uh, anyway, yeah, it was, it was, uh, I, I, I just thought that was the most magical ma- marriage, uh, that we, that I had experienced in pro wrestling, Steve and Vince. I agree. It was, it was something else. And of course we finally get this cage match and it's going to be best remembered for, uh, the ass kicking that Vince takes and the bump off of the cage through the table. I mean, I don't think anybody saw that coming. And then speaking of things you don't see coming a very big debut, what's going to become the big show. We know him as the giant from WCW. He's going to come out from underneath the canvas and throw Austin into the cage so hard that the cage breaks open and Austin drops down to the floor. That means he won and he's on his way to WrestleMania. It's a big opportunity to sign a big talent, literally like the giant Paul white, but, uh, this is an interesting way to have him debut here. Normally it feels like that would have been something you guys would have had pomp and circumstance for and done on TV. Instead it's done on a pay-per-view. What'd you think of that creative? Well, I thought at the end of the day, over the years that we didn't do a great job of managing big shows career. I I thought we overexposed him. Bottom line, he was an attraction. He was our Andre. It, it, that was the intended direction to, to go in. Uh, but I didn't think we did an overall start to finish great job and how we utilize uh, big show. I just, I just too much. He, he, we didn't keep him special, right? We didn't keep him unique. 
And I thought that was a big mistake at the, at, at the end of the day. Uh, so, but it's a calculated risk. And, and it also says to a pay-per-view consumer, you never know what's going to happen. They had a surprise. Day. They had a big show come out there. Well, yes. we didn't know he was even going to be there. Right. So that's kind of the theory behind that is that when you watch a, uh, a WWE pay-per-view, you just really never know what's going to happen or who's going to show up. That was the theory behind big show debuting that night. And it was a good out for Steve to win the match without climbing over the top of the cage and those bad knees and all that stuff. So, uh, I thought that was a decent finish actually. I love the creative. I think it's fantastic. You know, uh, slinging him into the cage and he's so yeah. strong. It broke the cage. The thing that stuck out to me though, is the big table bump. <clears throat> Vince falling off the cage through a table. Yeah. You don't expect him to, to see him do that, but we've heard that his son, Shane was a daredevil. And we know some of the crazy stunts he pulled. And just a few years ago at the pandemic WrestleMania, I guess they were asking Gronkowski to take a big bump off a platform. Vince did it. And back at WrestleMania 12 in rehearsals, Vince does the zip line that he's going to have Shawn Michaels do on the show. So I right. understand the theory is. Hey, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to do something that I wouldn't do myself sort of thinking. And he says that he says that consistently since I first got there. Uh, I remember, you know, Vince saying, I'm never going to ask the talent to do anything I wouldn't do. Right. And, uh, it's good. just good school spirit. You know, it's, it's good for the brand because he was willing to do, uh, what it took to get to achieve success in a particular storyline. And he did more often than not in a moment like this, though, the chairman taking a bump off the cage through a table. Do you remember yeah. anybody trying to talk him out of it? Or does everybody know better? That won't even work. Don't waste your time. And don't waste your breath. Yeah. Don't waste your breath. This is what he wants to do. Right. You know, you, you got a great relationship with Bruce Pritchard and Bruce has been, uh, joined to hip with Vince for off and on for many, many years, decades. Yeah, he could tell you better than I, in that respect, I worked hand in hand with Vince for over 20 years. So I got a little experience working with him. Right. And, and, uh, other than how he produced talent, he was, he was a big, big asset to my career. Uh, so, but you, there's no sense in trying to talk him out of it. You know, you, you kind of make sure what, what the bump looks like and they couldn't go over a lot of things cause he couldn't tear a table up and, and the, you know, the afternoon uh, that I can recall. And, uh, so anyway, he just, he was a team player and he just defied age and, and gravity at times. Well, let's talk about, um, the, the, the big angle here, it's going to be the rock Austin beer bath. And there's always been a lot of talk, uh, and some controversy and discussion as we're building towards WrestleMania 15 here, that it's going to be a three-way. And the original idea was that it was supposed to be rock Austin and Foley who had been white hot. We just talked about that incredible pop, but as the story goes, Shawn Michaels said, no, the WrestleMania main event is not a three-way it's two guys. And unfortunately, totally agree with that. You do agree with that. Oh, oh totally. Yeah. Oh, totally. Cause it's not about, here's the deal. And, and, you know, I hired both rock and mankind, Mick Foley. So I got great respect for them. I love those guys like their sons still do, but this wasn't about them. Right. This is about taking Austin on this next step. The next step as it worked out was the championship. So to me, that was the overwhelming priority, even though Sean was banged up and wasn't a hundred percent, uh, you know, look, let's be honest about it. Sean Marcus could be problematic. I attribute a lot of that to his, uh, drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, he's in constant pain, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he was, uh, he, he, that was the only match to me. I didn't even, I wouldn't even had another consideration to be honest with you. I just, it's all about getting Austin over. So those, the guys that we just mentioned, like mankind and, and uh, rock could work with Austin and others Austin could work with several guys. We had a lot of guys that were, were logical challengers. 
Triple H has won, for example. So I, I believe it was the right way to go, and I would not have done a three-way. What, what's, I think Sean was absolutely spot on. Well, I, I love to hear that. And I also want to add some context to the idea that, you know, we could have gone with a baby face main event. We could have gone yeah. perhaps with, we know how hot Foley has been and, and he's the world champ and we could certainly just do that and, and have it be Austin versus mankind. However, my understanding is WrestleMania six was the first baby face WrestleMania where it was Austin or, or, or Hogan warrior and. Maybe that buy rate was a little disappointing. And then we did the same thing six years later with Sean and Brett. And maybe that was disappointing. Do you think Vince was hesitant to do baby face versus baby face because he had tried it twice before and either could one was really special. It could be Conrad. Yeah. It could be, it could be on to something right there. Uh, but still the, the, the logical booking, right. Is you book Austin, your top guy. Yes. And let them, when you got a, a situation where you got one talent, this, uh, look, Austin wasn't a hundred percent healthy either. So you're dealing with two unique situations here, but those two guys knew how to work with each other and how to work period. So I didn't, you know, I, I knew that the match was going to be decent, better than decent because what you're going you're working towards, you got the Tyson element in there. Uh, you got, uh, the championship on the line. You got a full house. So I, I, I thought it was uh, the, the only the way to go. And I, I've thought more about it in this podcast today than I have prior to that, because right. I just, to me, it was just, like I said, a no brainer. It's gotta be Sean. It's gotta be Steve, get Steve over and, and depend on his skill set and passion to, to become the champion and Sean Michaels, uh, wanting to go out in a, in the right way. And he did. And so, and I don't know how, I can't tell you how much pain the dude was in, but it was significant, uh, to say the very least, but he gutted it out, did his job. And, uh, for that, I'm, uh, I'm glad I was there to call it. We, uh, we should also mention that after the giant makes his debut here, five weeks into the company, Austin's going to beat him. Uh, and Austin's white hot. And I guess this, you know, doesn't really matter. But certainly I think if we had it to do over again, perhaps we would have built towards a singles match on pay-per-view and maybe taking our time with it. Do you think the, the bloom was off the rose fairly quickly with Vince and Paul white at the time? It seemed like, uh, it might've been, uh, but you know, Paul white wasn't ready for that push. He was, he just got there. Right. And it wasn't like he left WCW red hot. No. So I, I. I don't know what more you could have done. He was not a hot heel. Okay. And, and, uh, I don't know if that affected Vince or or not. I, I can't remember the numbers to tell you better than I could tell you, Connie, as far as the TV ratings, what big show was featured, uh, and, uh, the the ticket sales for big show was featured, et cetera, et cetera. I just think that we got way ahead of ourselves on promoting big show. He could have been a much more valuable asset. If we had taken more time to build his TV character, we should talk about, you know, you mentioned earlier, you're dealing with Bell's palsy at the time. So you're not on camera. A lot of the commentary is being done by Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler. That's not to say you're not involved with the company. What are you doing during these shows? Are you, are you making the towns and working backstage? Or are you just sticking to the office at the time? No. Well, I stuck to the office because of travel. Yeah. And, and me being kind of screwed up, uh, I came back early. Vince is very ready for me to come back to work. Apparently we talked, you know, when are you going to be back? When could you go? And we said, we're going to figure when you're starting back, all those kind of things. So, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 stay, I, I, I did payroll and I did booking. Same thing I always did, Connie. I never missed booking or payroll, uh, even while I was sick. I'd sit at my kitchen table and Norwalk and we're off exit 13 <laughs> and I'd do my, I do get my work done. Then, then when I got to feeling better and I wasn't so grotesque looking, I went to the office and did work, worked out of the office as I like to do. And then, uh, you know, it's just, and then at TVs, I would go to TV and produce the announcers. 
Right. Which, uh, something I enjoyed. So, uh, I, I stayed busy cause that's the way I got through it. The way I got through being off the, off the, off the show and being dormant was the way I just described. I still stayed very busy and I had something to do. And I think it motivated me to get back in the saddle at ringside and rejoin Lawler. Let's, uh, let's ask about your relationship with Steve. I mean, I, I know that you guys were, were super tight, but in this era, when you're not on the road as often, are you in regular communication with him by phone or is it just sort of see you when I see you sort of thing? Well, we, we talk about uh, probably once a week, maybe more. I, I always, I always waited on him to call. Right. Uh, so I didn't seem like a nuisance, uh, and he could see through that anyway. So, uh, but we communicated regularly. So I, I, I thought, I thought that in my role uh, that I grew into with Steve, I needed to do that. And I think he would agree if you asked him today, did JR help you during your the hot period? He's going to tell you absolutely. Cause sometimes he would have questions and he'd have, he didn't have booking questions. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I, uh, and I appreciated that he wanted my feedback and it's been that way ever since we're still very close. You know, we don't talk once a week like we used to, right? but that's not an indictment. It's just a fact of the matter. You know, he's busy. Life. Yeah. He's lived in, he's lived in Nevada. Uh, you know, I don't see him. Uh, he's not, he doesn't do, we're not in the same place at the same time anymore. Right. I wish we were, you know, I'm going to start doing a lot more appearances. Uh, that's my goal. Do a few more appearances. I think it'd be good for me to get out there and, and, and press the flesh with our fans. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy, you know, I enjoy it when I get those three generations there, the little boy, the dad who was at it, grew up in the attitude era and the grandpa who's been watching wrestling since it was on, uh, syndication. So you got three gen. I like that. It's kind of cool. When you got three generations of fans that remember specific things about one's work. And, uh, so I, I'm going to be doing more appearances. The reason I bring that up is not only for the lame plug, but also Steve didn't do those appearances right. very often. Right. He might, he might do some here, there, and yon. I know that, but basically speaking, we're not at the same place at the same time. You know, I, I'm assuming he'll be at WrestleMania. I won't be at WrestleMania, so I'm not going to see him there. So I, I figure the the best best way this is going to work out is uh, if I get one of these weeks off and I go to visit. He's been invited me 20 times to his new place, so I, I might take him up on that sooner than later. I just like we enjoy hanging out together. We'll we'll talk tell old stories from time to time. He'll ask me questions about different talents. He's tried to get me on his show, uh, and it just didn't, hasn't worked out yet. It's not because of him or because of me. Just, I think, uh, I don't know. People are still uncomfortable that I'm so identifiable with WWF, WWE, uh, that they're, you know, where, where are we on this deal? I know a lot of the, my work and I really enjoy the A and E stuff on Sunday nights. Yes. Uh, uh, good stuff. They did a great job of editing and all that, but man, oh man, uh, it's, uh, some of that stuff was cut out. Some of my, some of my sound bites were not used, which I understand. I got paid. Right. So use it or not, I don't care, but it's, it was pretty good stuff. But I was kind of surprised that it, more of it didn't make air, but I really do enjoy those Sunday nights. It gives me a, a destination on Sunday nights now that, uh, Yellowstone is not in uh, first run because that was my Sunday night go-to for a long time. Well, I know that you've always been Austin's go-to and, and you're actually going to come back to call his main event match with the rock at WrestleMania 15. Uh, how do you remember that going down? Does, does Steve come to you and say, Hey, I want to ask Vince about this, or does he just tell Vince? And then you hear about it after the fact that I want, I want Jr. on my call. Uh, he mentioned it. He made it public that that's what he'd prefer. And it's not the hill to die on if you're Vince. Right. Uh, Vince knew that I would give a 
the most passionate call of anybody on our announce roster. At least that was my thought. Uh, cause Steve meant more to me than he meant to any other announcer personally. And that comes across on the air. Uh, so, uh, but I think it's, I think Vince and, and rock was involved in it. Uh, oh, that's Sean, right? Yeah. You're talking about the match with Sean in Boston. No, no. We're talking about WrestleMania 15 rock and, uh, in Austin and Philadelphia. Okay. And well, it, it's no, going to rock be- was involved. Look, let's put it this way. Rock was involved in this whole conversation as well. Of course. So rock and Steve lobbied for the lack of a better term, uh, for me to call that match because they trusted me and they knew that they both meant the world to me as men and as professional wrestlers. And so, uh, I, I felt, I've always been felt very honored that they would do that. And, uh, but you know, Hey, Vince got a win out of it too. He made his two top stars happy. Yeah. That's a win. Uh, he got his most established voice back in the saddle for, uh, this major match between, you know, Hey, who knew that they were going to have three WrestleMania main events, right? Nobody else has ever done that. I don't think. No. So, you know, it's, uh. It was an interesting era to say the very least. And those two guys were very loyal to me because I had reciprocated. I was very loyal to them. I'm curious, you know, uh, it's a big deal. Obviously Austin rock is going to be the thing that makes this company the most money. And now we've got it at a WrestleMania in the main event and you're back doing commentary for it. Is it sort of understood that this isn't a one-off I'm coming back to do this. And then I'm back in the saddle. No, I, I thought, I think it was always JR is healthy enough to work. Okay. And we're going to use him. And, well, uh, you know, I think, uh, that was probably was a time my worth was established very clearly. And, uh, I should have taken advantage of it quite frankly, but I, uh, I was getting paid well. So it was what it was. Of course. We know the win here is Austin's he's now a three time WWF champion. Um, as you see there, if you're watching over on YouTube, uh, posing with his hand raised and of course a foot on a downed Vince McMahon, uh, and they're going to keep I got, going. I, I have those boots right there. He's wearing. That's right. In your living room, right? Yeah. In Oklahoma. So if you want to go rob me, oh my goodness. No. Oh, well, hell I'm serious. You never know anymore, man. Look at that. What happened to, what happened to uh, our buddy Wardlow? Oh yeah. That was man. crazy. It was. Now, you know, hopefully he, it's a learning experience. Never leave anything in your car that you don't mind getting stolen. Wow. Simple as that. And the area that we were in, in the Bay area, uh, we were given, uh, email warnings, uh, of what might could happen if you're not careful. And sure enough, I think this happened also at the hotel. I'm not sure, but, uh, it was. You never know him anymore. It's the hell of a world we live in, Connie. And when you, when your company has to warn you, you might not, might not want to wear your Rolex, right? Uh, you might not want to leave anything in your car that could be seen. Uh, you might, you might want to listen to this advice as, as opposed to being defiant and, uh, and, and saying, oh, it won't happen to me. It happens to anybody. It could happen to anybody. I felt bad for Wardlow too. Well, totally unrelated news, Jim. I can't wait to show you my, uh, my new ring use TNT title. I'll show you that next time I see you, but, uh, just, just recently found one, bought one online. Yeah. Did you really? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, uh, listen, we're going to keep going with rock and Austin for the next pay-per-view backlash on April 25th from Providence. Uh, of course it's a WrestleMania rematch. We know it's going to be box office, but in the buildup. We revisit something we did back in 97 where Austin threw the rocks intercontinental title belt off the bridge and into a river. This time the rock is going to threaten to throw Austin's brand new custom made smoking skull belt off the bridge and into the river. Austin shows up, there's a brawl and then rock is going to knock Austin off the bridge into the river and then throw Austin's belt in too. 
Is there anything these two guys can't get away with? I mean, <laughs> think about how silly that sounds on the surface. And then I'll just throw his ass off the bridge. Yeah. No, I, I they could, they could do no wrong. Connor. Yes. Yes. The fans have made that all important emotional investment in both those guys. They were, they were in, uh, committed. They signed their letter of intent. They're going to go play. And, uh, and the, and the more main event, uh, matches in on pay-per-view, especially that they could be in, uh, the better they liked it. So they liked to perform it, like it better. They wanted to be different than the last time. They wanted the audience to see a, a different presentation, all leading in the same direction, but a different presentation way of presenting it. And they took a lot of pride in that. It wasn't like, well, let's just do what we did in St. Louis. I heard that one time in Tulsa, I was getting ready to referee a match between, uh, Harley race and Dory jr. Uh, and for the NWA title, and they were going to go 60 minute draw. And they did, uh, which had me scared to death because I knew if I made one stupid count out, counted out too quickly, uh, and the wrong guy won, uh, I, I visioned in my mind that I would be blackballed from the, from wrestling, <laughs> which is not, I made that up. I mean, that was my mindset. I was scared to shitless. But, uh, and that's the only thing before that match that Harley and Dory asked me to do, get down on the floor and show us how you count. And I thought it might've been a half ass rib, but it wasn't. Uh, and so they, they saw my count and it, it played a part into the match because there was a lot of real close near falls where people thought that, uh, junior was going to win the title from Harley. So, uh, you know, I don't know how I got on that tangent, but anyway. It's just, you, you get yourself in those situations where you, you're afraid to, uh, make the wrong count. And I was young. God dang. I was tw in my twenties referee matches like that was, I, I, sh I don't know if I was even ready for that cowboy thought I was. And at that time, that's all that mattered. Well, I'll tell you what the creative here of, you know, we're we got hearses, we got ambulances, we're throwing guys off bridges. You know, as long as you've got the right players, I guess you don't have to lose any sleep over it. And I know these days you and I aren't losing any sleep. Thanks to sleep me. Here's the thing, guys. We already know this science has proven that cold sleep creates better sleep. I knew that I was cranking down the AC, turning on the ceiling fan. If you live where JR and I live, you got to have a ceiling fan because we know we sleep better that way. Well, here's the reality. Temperature controlled sleep repairs your muscles after a hard day's work and it improves your cognitive function. So you always start your day feeling sharp, confident, and energized. And that's where sleep me comes in with the hot tag. They're bringing you the same great sleep that chili sleep offered, but under a new name. And I've found that sleep me makes the coldest sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets our body's natural need for lower core temperatures. And the result is deeper, more restorative sleep. This has certainly been my experience. I'm dreaming for the first time ever. Thanks to this product. Seriously. I'm not saying that to be funny or cute, but I have bright, vivid, colorful dreams that tells me I'm getting the best possible sleep. Now these sleep systems are water-based, but it's not a water bed. It's a temperature controlled mattress pad. It fits over your existing mattress. You see water has these amazing thermal properties so they can heat it up or cool it off and then just pump that air through your bed. My wife and I share a bed. Obviously she likes to sleep warmer than I do. I like to sleep colder. We can do all of that. And she even has her side automated with the brand new sleep me app, but now they've got something that's incredible. Yes. Think of this as like a, a smart thermostat for your bed, but now they just launched the doc pro sleep system with new hyper AI. This is the ultimate cooling power with the doc pro sleep system. You pair it with the new app and you get real time temperature adjustments based on your current sleep activity. All thanks to this new hyper AI technology. This is the industry's first sleep tech. That's going to optimize your sleep and it's going to happen in real time. Why not get the best sleep of your life with AI driven technology head on over right now to sleep.me slash JR to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new doc pro Uller or cube sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for grilling JR listeners and only for a limited time. That's sleep S L E E P dot M E slash JR 
to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up feeling refreshed every day. So listen, let's get back to what's next here. After Austin has been thrown off the bridge here, the rock is going to hold a funeral for Austin and show up with the old smoking skull belt. He had swerved us with and show it wasn't really thrown into the river. And then Austin shows up driving a huge Austin 316 personalized monster truck. And Austin actually had this to say, uh, so I go into the back door of the arena and I'm in a holding room with a couple of curtains in front of me. And the monster truck was loud as fuck. And that 1800 power motor is churning out exhaust fumes. So I'm in this room and they shut the door behind me. It was about a three minute commercial break. So the whole time the people back home are watching commercials. I'm in a room inside breathing menthol alcohol fumes. I could barely menthol. breathe methyl. Yeah. Me- yeah. 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 I was just begging for the show to come back on air <laughs> so I could change it. So I could charge it out in the audience and get a breath of fresh air. I'm breathing all these exhaust fumes motherfucker. I was going to crash through that gate doing 98 and go and take my own <laughs> cue and haul ass into the arena. If they hadn't cued me when they did, I was about to die. Wow. Now, of course we have no idea any of this is happening. We just see this giant jacked up truck barreling into the arena and what a visual it was, but, uh, wow. He loved that kind of stuff too, man. He loved that stuff with a passion driving things. He loved to drive things. And I bet you on that, that his home in Nevada. Now he's probably got a half a dozen, uh, SUVs or what you call them? The little utility vehicle. Yes. Four wheel, four wheeler type thing. Yep. There's no telling how many of those he's got collected. <laughs> he likes driving things. It's amazing to think about, you know, Austin running over a Lincoln town car. This is very much the era where we're trying stuff. You know, Austin's putting cement in somebody in Mr. McMahon's car or running over a hearse or running over a town car and another memorable moment with, uh, Austin and some motors here. And he goes on to beat the rock at backlash. Uh, thanks to a little help from Vince McMahon who took out the referee for the match, uh, his son, Shane, and then gave Austin back the smoking skull championship. So now we have Austin and Vince seemingly on the same side, which I don't think anybody could have even imagined just a month prior to this. What'd you think of that pairing? You know, that, uh, after all this time feuding together, what if we put them on the same side of the fence? Yeah, I didn't like it. No, 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 wasn't high on it. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, there's, there were, I thought there were better ways to keep those guys potent on television. And, uh, and I, and I could be wrong. Just a creative thing. Creative is so subjective, all creative. There's, there's more than one. There's always. In my experience in wrestling, there's always more than one right way to get things done. So, uh, I didn't hate it, but you know, I didn't like the, uh, WrestleMania 17 creative as we've discussed here before, where Austin turned heel, but did he really, right? Not really. He didn't really turn heel because people didn't buy it. And I felt bad for Steve because he's on a, he's on a, he's on a trip. That's not got. It's not the course is not laid out. Well, people were not ready to see John Wayne become uh, a Nazi. And that's kind of what I equated this whole thing to. So, you know, uh, strange times, man, Vince and, and look again, I said this earlier, if Austin had not wanted to do it, right. It would not have happened. And I did all I could to convince him it was the wrong way to go years later. He agreed with me, but we'd already done it. So, uh, I just thought he was one of those guys that you couldn't book like a regular guy. Let's turn him heel. I just, I, he, he, he may have lessened his own value. Uh, quite frankly, he may not have realized how over he was and, uh, but he was. And the fans just never bought into the whole scenario. Even when he, you know, they, they were, they booed him pretty good in, in Oklahoma city. When he busted me open, he used that scaffold to cut my head. That was not fun. Uh, I don't think a scaffold has been used since that was not a good idea. I didn't even know he was going to use a scaffold. 
I just, I was getting color in the story. Right. So, uh, but anyway, I, I didn't say all the credit was great. Some of it like better than others, but the Austin McMahon togetherness was not something that I would have advocated. I just didn't think it was the right time and, and the right time may never happen. I didn't mind seeing old John Wayne put those Calvary blues on movie after movie. It didn't bother me. I liked them. I liked that style. I was there because I liked John Wayne and that blue Calvary outfit or a Marine outfit or wherever the hell. So anyway, uh, hard to, it's hard to pick apart things that were, that have become so successful, but the key thing we should have been doing right there, I think is getting somebody else ready for Steve, uh, that he could go out and have a match with because he couldn't have a match with Vince and no, no disrespect to Mr. McMahon. His skill set was limited. It was amazing that he was doing the things that he was doing. Yes. Steve, and, and equally amazing Conrad that Steve was going for it and he was enjoying it. So, uh, they got into the routine together and I thought they did a, they did a, a good job, but I, when you look at how over Austin became, it doesn't happen without Vince in a story. Well, the next night on raw after seemingly Vince is now siding with Austin, Austin has to return the favor. Stephanie McMahon is tied up on the undertaker symbol. Uh, he's about to, uh, force his way into marriage with, uh, Stephanie McMahon. He had, uh, of course, famously abducted her the night before in that pretty me- memorable scene where it's revealed that the undertaker was the driver of the limo that she's in where to Stephanie. Uh, and then a very relieved Vince <laughs> comes out to thank Austin for saving Stephanie and his daughter. And, yeah. uh, and now we've got an interesting little plot twist for our soap opera. If you will, Yeah. Shane and taker are leading the corporate ministry and somehow Vince and Austin are going to be strange bedfellows here. Austin even loses the title to the undertaker at the uh, May 23rd pay-per-view in Kansas city over the edge. You see, if you're watching on YouTube here, undertaker holding up the uh, smoking skull belt here, both Shane and Vince were the guest referees and Shane is going to quick count takers pin on Austin to end the match. And unfortunately no one ever even remembers that because this is the pay-per-view where we lost Owen. So it's just sort of irrelevant at that point. Yeah. Maybe still is. Yeah. Quite frankly, June 7th, we finally see the big reveal. So this would have been, you know, two weeks after the pay-per-view and we want to know who is this greater power, this higher power who we have constantly seen the corporate ministry refer to. And there's been lots of rumor in innuendo that maybe it was going to be Jake Roberts, or maybe it was going to be Christopher Daniels, or of course it was me, Austin. It was me all along. It turned out it was Vince and he was behind everything, including the Stephanie abduction. And uh, Vince would explain this was a way just to get for him to earn Austin's trust and get that title off of Austin. At the time, I think a lot of people felt like this was a letdown. Maybe they thought it was going to be a debut of a new character. Was it a letdown to you at the time? No, it fit. It fit. Yes. It fit to me, uh, because you want to Vince back in that alpha male heel role. Yes. And that's because tr- the track record has proven that worked. Right. So, and it, surrounding Vince with some new bedfellows, uh, the triple H is getting pushed up and others, uh, I thought was very advantageous for us. So Vince could provide his rub to other heels that we wanted to prepare to work with Austin sooner than later. Well, we should, uh, we should at least mention that's not the end of that story. Of course, Linda and Stephanie were not a part of this quote unquote swerve. And they announced that they had given their 50% share in the company to the new CEO stone cold, Steve Austin. And the idea that of course, Vince, you know, worked to have his daughter. He didn't like that deal. That. That business deal he didn't like. <laughs> no doubt. But what an ultra heel that makes this guy. Not only is he, you know, the antagonist for our favorite performer, Stone Cold Steve Austin, but he even 
has his daughter abducted and she doesn't know this is part of the plan and neither does his wife. And well, this leads to some fun segments with Austin in charge at Titan towers. And this is some great stuff. He's getting all the office staff to talk, to take part in drinking contests. He's dumping horse manure in Vince's office. Uh, these <laughs> segments that were shot at, at Titan towers, this is probably some of the most fun Steve had had at the company at this point. No. And he, and he enjoyed that. He enjoyed Steve enjoyed doing comedy. Yes. If, if it was in the right presentation. So, uh, that creative that you saw was done without a writer, uh, without a script. It was just a collaborative effort between Steve and the producers, uh, to get these sound bites. That guy in the middle there on the top is Matt DeLuca, who was the head of HR. John Arnold's up there at the top, right? Uh, I'm not sure what John did, but he had a, he was there forever. That little gal down the bottom left is our, was a receptionist at that time. And I think Vince, his office is where Austin's sitting in the top left. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. All that red stuff. He liked to, that was his deal. That was his jam. Well, we know that his jam is really going to be a handicap match at King of the ring. It's going to be Austin on one side and Vince and Shane McMahon in a handicap ladder match. And this is to have full control of the company. Uh, the idea is you climb the ladder, you grab the briefcase, and then you're the boss. But as this happens and Austin's about to grab it and win the briefcase mysteriously is raised higher. So Austin can't reach it. Um, listen, we're having some fun with the creative, but in hindsight, what an interesting pay-per-view main event. I mean, I think if we tried to do that today, boy, people would just be up in arms. They want something different, but the story was so good and the characters were so strong. Yeah. It's still doing money. It's crazy. People love that marriage. Yes, they do. They, they love that marriage, man. They love that. Austin. Give me Austin McMahon in any form that you believe is good and I'll watch. And that's where we were with that deal. I just, you know, think about, and I realize these are not characters. Uh, they're, they're not television characters, but think about the absurdity of, okay. Uh, Kenny Omega, if you're a W world champion at the next pay-per-view, we're going to have you in a ladder match against, uh, Tony Khan and his father, Mr. Khan, like what? <laughs> and so it's like, what, what do you want me to do with that? But somehow it works. Uh, yeah. and of course, magically, wouldn't, you know what? They lower those briefcases a little lower and McMahon's are going to regain control. They win the match and now they run the company again. And this has been one of the great mysteries in the WWF because they never revealed who re- who raised the briefcase. There was for a big reveal, right? Do you remember there being a discussion about who it could have been or was supposed to be? I don't recall off the top of my head. I'm sure it was discussed to some degree. Cause it gives somebody an opportunity to have an issue with Austin. Yes. So, but I don't remember honestly, Connie, who, how deep we went into that conversation. It would have been a great role for triple H. Yeah. If that had gone down that way. But, uh, as you said, it, it didn't appear to, it didn't appear to go that way. Of course, the next night on raw Vince says, Hey, now that I'm in control again, Austin, you're back to the bottom of the cards. You're going to have to work your way back up. But Austin reveals, nope, back when I was still CEO, I, uh, set up a match between myself and the undertaker for the world title. And that match is tonight. So just one night after this pay-per-view Austin winds up winning the match. And he's now a four time WWF champion. Uh, and, and Austin is running a breakneck pace here. He's running almost every big show. I'm sure the merch money is blowing and going. You've talked about before that he got a million dollars just for one quarter on t-shirts alone. Yeah. But when he's being run ragged like this, doing all the media, doing the skits, making TV, making the house shows, uh, it starts to wear and tear on a fellow. Does it not? Oh yeah. You know, uh, we, we kind of got a little taste of that in the NBA with load management for a while there. That was the top, the hot topic in the NBA was. Uh, load management for some of their stars, uh, not getting wore down to the bone before there's a physical intervention and they're given some time off or they don't play as many minutes or what have you. Uh, I don't know that we, you know, if you try to unbook Austin and I did more, more than one occasion, all it did was piss him off. Right. Cause in his world in the stone cold world, that was a sign of weakness and uh, he wasn't ready to wave that, that. What he thought would be a, 
a white flag, but he was, he was working, we were working his ass off. But when you say, Hey, Steve, how about some time off in two weeks or three weeks? Uh, you know, no, I'd say, he'd say, where are we booked? I'd tell him. And, uh, he said, well, how do you, how do you think that's going to do it? I said, it's going to do well. Uh, it's going to sell tickets. It's a good market, blah, blah, blah. It's a lot worth those shows for sure. Uh, but you couldn't talk him out of not working. He just liked to be back on the road. He felt, he felt more secure. Uh, the, the arena, the venues that he appeared in were kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a home for him. I think he felt more comfortable there than he did at home. So, uh, I, and that's just his nature. He had a very obsessive personality. And, uh, I think we including specifically me could have been more assertive and saying, no, I'm unbooking you on these shows, but I didn't do that because again, the last thing you want is in a person in administration is to create a rift between anybody that's a top talent, anybody period, but especially the top talent guys, uh, to, uh, you know, keep them happy as happy as you can in such a freaky business. Well, let's talk about, uh, what we're building to next. It's going to be the July pay-per-view. It's a first blood match and the stipulations are a little crazy. If Austin wins, then Vince has to leave the, leave the WWF. But if Taker wins, Austin will never get a title shot again. And on the raw leading up to the show, Vince even signs the contract for the match using Austin's own blood after Taker had attacked and busted Austin open. And it feels like we're raising the stakes almost a little too much. Some of these are stipulations for who has full control of the company. Who's going to be the CEO. Uh, you never get a title shot again. You have to leave forever. Is this just the episodic nature of crash TV and what was working? Or did you think at the time, man, we're, we got crazy stipulations every single week. Maybe we should slow down with some of this. I thought we should have slowed down up maybe a half a step yeah, and let the, 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 the overness, uh, carry us, uh, of our talents. And again, I, I heart back on the same thing. I'm booking the house shows, the live events, and I needed, I needed more guys over, oh, excuse me to, uh, I needed more guys over to put them in on those cards, right. That would sell guys that would sell tickets. And that's why I was always so adamant that, you know, triple H get his, his shot, his tag guys like that. You know, you don't want to forget guys that got over triple H Mick Foley taker. We had a lot of guys that were over, Yes. but how are we going to utilize them? How are we going to maximize their, their, uh, their presence? Uh, and that was always a point of discussion. I was keenly aware of it because I was, as I said, I was booking the house shows. And you know, how far down the car do you go before you start hitting shallow water? So, uh, that was something I thought of cause Vince didn't make live events. Right. So I have my, the number one heel was unavailable for, for, for live events. And that's a tough task. If you're a quote unquote booker, uh, to, to address. Well, I'm glad you said that because it feels like it's coming to an end. It feels like it's run its course because at that match fully loaded on pay-per-view July 25th, it's Austin versus taker first blood Austin wins, which means per the agreement of the stipulation of the match, Vince is technically gone from the WWF. And maybe we think at that point, you know, to your, your point, we need to make sure these guys that we're promoting so well on TV can make the live events. And maybe yeah. we just think creatively, what else is there to do? Uh, but that creative is starting to frustrate Mr. Austin. The torch would write this Wade wrote this on August 7th, 1999. Steve Austin has been frustrating management lately with his vetoing of ideas for television matches on the July 26th. They're all management proposed that Austin faced Jeff Jarrett in a short singles match, leading the triple H interfering Austin turned down that match. Management yep. proposed an alternate plan of facing Billy Gunn with the same finish of Triple H interfering. Austin turned that down. Also, apparently arguing that Jarrett and Gunn aren't over enough yet to deserve the rub of fighting him on TV. Do you remember this? Yeah, of course. Talk to me about it. Well, you know, it's just again, 
it's not the ideal situation. And people say, well, Austin was holding them up. Right. No, he was, all he was doing printing money. That's what he was doing. Right. And, and if you ask any of the talents, we had two shows. The first thing they looked at was the old Hogan analogy. I want to see where's Hogan booked. Right. If I'm on that card. I'm good. Same thing with Austin. If Austin was booked, they wanted to be on that show. So, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, heck it just made sense to me. I, I, I just, you don't deviate from, from what's over for, for without a great reason. Like they stopped drawing, for example, they stopped selling as many tickets. They start selling as much merchandise. And it didn't seem to me like just based on my fragile memory, uh, that that was the case with Steve at that point in time, he still was productive as hell. Let's talk about something else that, uh, Wade would write in the torch the next day at the Tuesday raw tapings, Austin turned down the idea of wrestling in a tag team match, teaming with rock against Billy Gunn and triple H in China. Instead, they resorted to yet another Austin versus undertaker match. And as it turns out, it didn't do well in the ratings. It drew the lowest raw main event rating for the overrun period since March 15th, which was the last time the nitro over uh, nitro outdrew raw during the overrun period. Management's frustration is that Austin has such a short list of who he believes is worthy of wrestling him undertaker, Kane rock and mankind. And that the time has come for Austin to give Jarrett and Gunn the same rub that Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels and undertaker gave to him when he was rising to main event status. Oh yeah. Austin's critics within the WWF would argue that he needs opponents to stay hot. So he better have a plan of where those opponents are going to come from. Austin sympathizers believe Austin vetoes will force management to do a better job preparing and building the next generation of opponents. Austin isn't going out of his way to do any favors for Jarrett. He and Jarrett are not close behind the scenes. And there's been underlying tension between the two of them since Jarrett first returned to the company and referred to Austin's 316 gimmick as blasphemous during his 1997 raw promo. So listen, we've talked about that forever and ever. We don't have to touch on the Jarrett awesome thing again, but there is some validity to the argument that for Austin to be where he is, he did have to have incredible feuds with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels and the undertaker. And those right. matches really did submit him as a top guy in the company. And it feels as if people are saying he's not willing to do the same, but I'm sure you have to hear that a lot in talent relations. No. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of these sources that Wade Keller used, I'm assuming were talents. Yeah, no doubt. And they wanted their share. They wanted their piece of that big old pie that also kept bacon. And, uh, you know, Steve just had great instincts to me and he knew what would work and what would not work. We couldn't afford to put Steve in a major match on like a raw main event or a pay-per-view main event, something along those lines and it not be uh, aesthetically good where it wasn't, where it was compelling programming. We couldn't afford to have a, a failure in that regard. Cause that's just not, you know, they didn't do it with Bruno. Bruno champion nine years. They got, they got they, they, their whole system was getting heels ready for Bruno back in the day. Right. Same thing with cowboy. When I worked for Watts, it was all about who's who's next for the dog. Who's going to fight the junkyard dog, uh, uh around the loop. So it, it's every, every dusty in Florida, Eddie Graham was in, and when cowboy was booking there, they always had heels stashed in, in, in line here. Here we go. That's just a concept that's been around forever. And it makes all the sense in the world is that you make sure that you nurture and develop the next great villain or your top baby face to face. And, uh, so that's how I see that, that whole situation. It was nothing new about the concept at all. Uh, but we still need to develop these heels. I've been saying that this whole show, that was one of my issues. Uh, you got that small little group of guys that fit in this cocoon, right? And the cocoon needed to get larger. We needed more choices. We needed more selection. And, you know, I'd love to book some of those young heels that Steve liked, uh, or he felt comfortable having a match with, I'd love that. But that's not, that's not what happened for a, for a good long while. Unfortunately, I just, uh, 
I find it interesting that when, when Steve Austin vetoes a couple of folks and says, no, I don't want to work with that guy. I don't want to work with that guy. It feels as if in the larger scope of things, he doesn't get this negative reputation that like a Hulk Hogan might for saying that doesn't work for me, brother, or maybe a Shawn Michaels might for not wanting to work with this guy or put that guy over or drop the belt here or there is Austin given a pass because the business is so hot and we know that it's a credit to him. So he's earned certain privileges. Cause that seems fair. Uh, well, that's one way of looking at it. And, and I sure you're, you're probably quite accurate. Uh, but he just had such great instincts about what worked for him. Right. And really that's all you should, he should be faced with is what works for me. Because if I'm still hot, everybody benefits. Like we said about those live events, guys love to be on Austin's live events because he sold more tickets. Therefore they made more money. And, uh, I don't know who loses in that equation. Well, we know that, uh, the triple H idea that you kicked out there is maybe he could have been the guy revealed to be raising the briefcase. Yeah. Well, it could have paid off because that was originally the main event of SummerSlam 99 on August 22nd. The torch had this to say on the 14th mankind has been added to the SummerSlam main event, perhaps due to a combination of political and injury related reasons. Mankind who's recovering from double knee surgery has been added to the Austin Hunter Hearst Helmsley match, making it a three-way bout for the title on the August 10th, raw tapings, which are set to air on the 16th, a round Robin series takes place. China pins triple H. Thanks to mankind's interference Foley pins China and then Foley and triple H fight to a draw when special referee, Shane McMahon and Shawn Michaels disagree over who the winner is as a result, Foley and triple H will get a title shot in a match against Austin at SummerSlam. Austin's knee injury is more serious than it appeared last week when the WBF was expecting him to return to house shows this past weekend. He wound up missing this past weekend's house shows the second weekend of shows in a row. So listen, that to me feels less political and more logical. If we got a guy who's coming off injury and he's fresh and ready to go, but our top guy who's also a baby face like mankind, if he's had to miss two weeks in a row of house shows. It might not be a bad idea to relieve some of that pressure. Let them have a three way. Is that sort of the thinking? Uh, that, that that's applicable and it's logical. You know, Steve was wearing down, man, bad wheels. Uh, he hated those knee braces, but he had to wear them. It's uh, you know, I used, he had, he had a little bit he used to do, uh, he told me, he said, I hate these goddamn knee braces. I feel like every time I walk the ring, people are yelling. Run forest, run. Oh my. And the Forrest Gump r- 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 racing and stuff, foot racing. Uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he, we needed to give him a break, right? We, we need to give him a break and get, if we could orthoscopically repair things where the rehabilitation time was lessened, then that's probably the way to go to get him cleaned up, so to speak. I'm asking about this because I think some folks might say was Austin hesitant on triple H. Did he think he was ready for the main event? Because at this point, I don't think triple H had main evented a pay-per-view yet. This is going to be really his first time. I know there was a UK specific pay-per-view along the way, but I don't think he had been in that main event position as of yet. Was Austin nervous, nervous or hesitant that he could pull it off? You think? No, I think he was excited about it because he knew the upside of triple H right. Triple H was a, is, was, and is a true student of the game. That's why he's in the position that he's currently in, uh, in, uh, WWE. Uh, so I think, uh, Austin realized triple H they, Hey, look, you're, you're all day at the venue, right? You had plenty of time to talk about stuff, business matches, potential, this, you know, different things. Uh, but I think over the course of those conversations that Steve developed a, a confidence that, uh, his matches of triple H, uh, have every reason to be damn good. And I thought that they had a great relationship. I thought that they had a great, I don't know how they were personally, uh, you know, hanging out and all that stuff. Austin's not a hangout guy, really. Uh, 
but I, I thought that uh, Triple H earned Austin's trust, and uh, I think that's good. I think that's really good. So, uh, but I, I I thought that was the I thought that was the booking we needed. I wanted to see Triple H get in that picture, get those rubs, and let him develop. And by the way, he developed really well. No doubt. He, he, he developed really well. He was a, a great wrestling heel. He could brawl, all those things, decent promos, uh, a lot of good stuff about Triple H that I endorse and still do. I think he's uh, good for wrestling and because he cares so much about it. Right. Any company you're, you're with or you're in, you know, you want to identify those that really have made that emotional investment and are serious about their profession. And Triple H was always very serious about his profession. Well, something that you and I are serious about is starting every single day with a little AG one. It became a regular yeah, part of my routine with my wife back at the start of the pandemic. Uh, she wanted to optimize our immune system, but we're still using it every single day because we want more energy. I don't like taking pills or vitamins. And if I'm going to take a supplement, I want it to actually taste good. And Megan still takes it because she thinks it provides better gut health. Whatever the reason with one delicious scoop of AG one, you're getting 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, everything you need to start your day. Right. It's a special blend of ingredients to support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, your focus, your recovery, your aging, all of the things. It's also lifestyle friendly, whether you're trying to do keto or paleo or vegan or dairy free or gluten free. There's less than one gram of sugar. There's no GMOs. There's no nasty chemicals. There's no artificial anything. And it still tastes good. It's going to support better sleep and recovery, better mental clarity and alertness. It costs you less than $3 a day. So why haven't you tried this folks? JR and I love it. You will too. And don't just take our word for it. This still blows away. Jim and I, they have more than 7,000 five-star reviews. I couldn't tell you the last time I sat down and left a review for anything much less a positive review. Like I see people all the time dunking on negative stuff online, but going out of your way to leave 7,000 five-star reviews. Come on y'all. Let's reclaim your health. Let's arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. What we're talking about is one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. There's no need for a million different pills and supplements. And to make it easy, athletic greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash JR. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash JR. Take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Yeah, it works folks. It works. It's not a hassle. It's not a pain in the ass to execute. It's affordable. It has everything in it in, 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 in this one serving to take care of what ails you. As my grandpa used to say, I love it athleticgreens.com forward slash JR. Yep. Now here's the deal, man. There's a lot of rumor and innuendo in wrestling, and I hate that negative horse shit, but we got to talk about it. The torch. <laughs> yeah, you don't hate it. So you don't hate it that much, do you? <laughs> well, listen, I know it's part of the story here in Austin's God, 99 I'm kidding. quote. Yep. There's widespread whispering behind the scenes that Austin pushed for mankind to be in the match so that Austin wouldn't have to do the J O B to Hunter when he loses the title. The three-way rules can be set up to where whoever scores the final pinfall becomes champion. If that's the scenario Austin pushes for, it doesn't do any favors for triple H since by pinning mankind, instead of Austin, he will lose the rub. He would have gained from beating the actual champion to begin his reign. Now, who the, wrote this Wade Keller. Oh, okay. The original plans for the next few months were triple H to pin Steve Austin to capture the world title. And then triple H would hold the title perhaps until the Royal rumble. At which point Austin would regain it in time to defend against big show at WrestleMania triple H would feud with mankind at first over the WWF title with management, believing that mankind would be the opponent who would give Hunter the best matches and interviews and thus the best chance to get him over as a legitimate main eventer. Meanwhile, Austin would have grudge matches at the September and October pay-per-views against Jeff Jarrett and Billy Gunn. It doesn't appear that the Austin Jarrett feud though, will take place. Austin has outright told management. He won't work a feud with Jeff Jarrett until Jarrett is more over with the fans. 
And the WWF set the stage for the Austin Jarrett feud over the last month or so with Jarrett calling out Austin over the house mic and Austin giving Jarrett several stunners. Austin though, has since vetoed a feud with Jarrett saying he isn't over enough to face him yet. And there are other thoughts that there is tension because Jarrett and Deborah have been friends dating back to their WCW days. And Jarrett was responsible for getting the WWF to hire Deborah. And now Austin is dating Deborah. Austin has also said he doesn't like Jarrett's in ring style because of Austin's power and influence. When it comes to his own storylines, it's almost a lock that the entire Jarrett feud won't happen. And instead Austin will move right into a feud with gun whom he personally likes and thinks would be a good opponent for him, man. There's a lot to unpack here. As I like to say, but the whole idea of the rumor, cause that's what it is. It's rumor and innuendo as Bruce would call it. Did Austin have a problem dropping the belt to Hunter? Do you think here in 99? No, he, they just were looking to, to do it. Look, if you're a great talent, like both Hunter and Austin are, were, uh, then the, you want to present that conflict, that match in the most ideal scenario that you could possibly create. And that is much like Sean Michaels said earlier. Uh, there's no three ways. It's just, you know, Steve and I, and that's the way it should have gone. And it's right call. And same thing here, you know, nobody, you know, you're building to a singles match, a major highly promoted singles match for the number one, number one contender, triple H versus the champion stone Cold, And I think that's the way to go with it. You, you, if you're going to showcase two great talents as these two men are, then, uh, you want to do it in a singles match, Conrad, in my opinion, just as an old school wrestling guy. Let's talk about the Austin Deborah relationship. Was it a headache for you? How do you hear about it? Was there some upsetness in the locker room or guys griping a little bit here or there? I heard nobody griping at all. Deborah is such a likable person and a sweetheart of a lady. And a lot of us met her, uh, when she was married to Steve McMichael, right back in the day, as they say, you know, I think I first met her at WrestleMania 10. Wow. Well, that's when the football players and Lawrence Taylor and yeah, all that stuff were 11, you know, I think maybe was it 11. Yeah. yeah, it was 11. Yeah. Cause 10 was Brett and Owen yes. in the garden. Uh, so, um, but she, she was very well liked and didn't, she didn't carry any baggage with her that, uh, was noticeable or negative that I can recall. No one ever came to me and said, Hey, what are you going to do about I got that with Triple H and Stephanie. Uh, what are you going to do about that? Well, what is there to do? I, I, you know, I don't, they're not under contract 24 hours a day and who they date and who they socialize with and all that stuff. Shit. So same thing here. Nobody, most of Steve's friends wouldn't say anything. They wouldn't say, as my grandpa would say, they wouldn't say shit with a mouthful. That's old school right there. That's old school, bro. And, uh, my grandpa's old. God bless him. He drank a half a pint of whiskey every day. Real tight. Yeah, man. Hey, I went back to Oklahoma. A little quick story here. Went to his favorite little liquor store. Uh, I went with him and he bought a bottle of half a pint of, uh, some rot ass bourbon deluxe. I remember the name now bourbon deluxe. I don't even know if it's still on, 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 uh, in liquor stores, no clue. And uh, so. I bought him a half a pint of crown Royal and, uh, he thought he had died and gone to heaven. He couldn't believe how it tastes, how smooth it was and all that stuff. So the crown Royal soon trumped the, uh, bourbon they deluxe. They still make it. I just Googled it. I had to look it up, but yeah, I Do found they? it. Yeah. Bourbon deluxe is still a thing. <laughs> it's not real high quality, uh, in most people's eyes. Yeah. Maybe bourbon deluxe, uh, connoisseurs would have a different story to tell, but I'll put up my crown Royal with that. Anytime Conrad, Conrad gets me, Conrad keeps me in that 18 year old stuff. <laughs> God dang, man. Well, it's, listen. it's like drinking, it's like drinking Snapple. Well, it's like smooth as hell. It's just, oh, and all of a sudden 
you look up and it's a long walk back to the kitchen because you're, you're bombed. Well, that's the thing. Uh, like you're, you're a hard man to buy for. What do you, what do you get for the guy who's got everything? Got his house. Like he likes it in Oklahoma wakes up on the beach uh, every day. Yeah. Lord have mercy. It's like, well, I know something he likes and, uh, something, Easy now. something he oh, might not, that, not, might not buy for himself. So here you go. You do. You come through every time. I appreciate it. I love you, Connie. You're a good man. Uh, I don't know where we were talking. I just, I enjoy talking to you and me talking about stuff. Absolutely. Well, we were talking about, uh, pop pops, uh, bourbon deluxe, but before we got there, <laughs> we were talking about Austin and Deborah and then how we're setting up SummerSlam. Oh, yeah, three yeah. way. She wasn't a problem. Yeah. The relationship wasn't a problem. The only time that I can recall the re- the relationship becoming somewhat problematic was when they were breaking up mm. and it wasn't like it was a chaos, right? Most people respected Austin's territory because he was helping them buy things, Rolexes and cars and boob jobs and all kinds of good stuff. All that good stuff. All the money's is coming in. The guys are making, you know, we had, I, I remember the other day I was talking to Billy Gunn about this. I, I see Billy Gunn and Jeff Jarrett every week at, at AEW. Yes. Speaking of those two dudes, they gen- we all generally dress together. So I, I, uh, I, I see them every week and, but we never talk about this cause it's not a big enough issue to bring it to dredge it up from the, from the ashes. Right. Uh, but S- S- Steve and Jeff just didn't have the get along. I don't know why I assume the origins of that are rooted in Memphis. Yeah. That's my guess. Uh, cause I've heard these, the, the, uh, Austin eating, living on potatoes in Memphis, yep. you know, we've all heard that story mm-hmm. and it's true. So I think the origins of the animosity or the lingering cloud over Jared and Austin, uh, was Memphis based. And I might be wrong, might be wrong as hell. And if I am, I bow down to you. So, uh, but they never, they never, were, Steve would not let that become an issue and, and neither would Deborah. Like I said, Deborah is probably one of the most popular, uh, uh, talents we had in the locker room. She's, she conversed. She was, she was, she could talk about a lot of things. She was a good hearted lady. You know, just their relationship came to an end and, you know, Conrad, you and I could both speak to relationships coming to an end because it happens to a lot of us. Yes, it does. Times. Yes, it does. So, you know, I just, I was always there for him, but her as well. Cause you know, when we, Jan and I, God bless her, uh, would go down to see Steve and Deborah. We went down there a couple of times to, uh, Texas and went to their place, San Antonio area at that time. So Jan had a good relationship with Deborah and she was, and they, they conversed, right? They, they, they still talked, you know? Uh, so it was a interesting time respect everybody's lane that they're traveling in and try to help them along is the way to go. Not, not stand in their way, not be a negative or anything along those lines. So, and when your wife is getting involved, like my wife was, because she was friends with Deborah, they shopped together and all that kind of shit. Uh, you know, I couldn't cut her. I said, you can't talk to her anymore. That's nothing but wrestling paranoia. No silly. And I ain't go, I ain't going to go there. I, that's, that's a sickness and it's, it's rot, it's rot in this business paranoia. Well, we did manage to, uh, overcome some of that paranoia when we got Jesse Ventura involved here at SummerSlam 99. He, uh, is now the governor of Minnesota and he's going to be the special guest referee, but at the end of the night, wouldn't you know it? Austin is looking at the lights, but not for Hunter instead. Foley is going to pin Austin. And then afterwards, Hunter is going to, uh, attack Austin. And that's going to put Steve out of action due to the knee problems. And without Austin on raw the next night, you're used to help get Hunter even more as a heel. He's going to break your arm to get a title match against Foley. Finally, he becomes the WWF champion for the first time. And Austin is off TV until he helps Vince McMahon on SmackDown. John Ruddy, you notice I'm wearing the slimming blacks. It works, baby. (laughs) 
Uh, so Austin does come back to SmackDown and he helps, uh, he helps, uh, Vince McMahon and in the process, well, uh, unbelievably Austin is making Vince McMahon the world champion. And of course, as you might imagine, the title is going to be vacated because nobody can beat Vince. He's got the pencil by God. So Austin the er- is the referee no, Conrad. He has the eraser. There you go. The most powerful weapon in all of wrestling bingo, which is a new bingo shirt game. now over at grilling JRTs about the eraser. Check that out. Uh, Austin yeah. is the referee for the six pack challenge at unforgiven where Hunter is going to regain the title by pinning rock. And Austin has to reluctantly count the pin. And then uh, on October 11th at the Georgia dome in Atlanta, what a special raw this is. It's a memorable one for you. Austin and triple H are having a verbal confrontation with Austin in the ring and triple H on the ramp. And when triple H comes to ringside, he goes over to you, Jim knocks off your hat, pushes you down in your chair, and, uh, you're not going to stand for it. So you get up and hit triple H with a little <laughs> electric fan that you have at ringside. Yeah, damn then, right. Don't screw with JR. Damn you. I love it. Austin's then going to hold triple H for you to slug him. And China's going to take you down with a spear. Like. I know you hated just being involved physically, but at this her, point, her right leg, she hit me right in the balls. Look at there. See, let's see what you're missing. If you're not on YouTube, you got it. You got to take a look at this on this same show. As if this wasn't enough, it's stone cold, Jim Ross taking on stone cold, Steve Austin and a tag match here against triple H in China. So he's picked you as a partner. Look at you with your stone cold Jersey and your wrist tape. You're ready to whoop some ass. Oh, buddy. I was like being Muskogee on a Friday night, payday Friday night, having a beer, having too many. Yeah. That was just, Hey, look, I was product is product placement. I oh. don't think I even left with that shirt. I don't know what they did with it, but nonetheless, that was my wrestling attire. My theory was Conrad to cover up as much of my body as I possibly could. I should have thought no, I should have worn long sleeves, <laughs> <laughs> but as much as I could, uh, uh, cover up. Was my goal because I was a fat ass and I had no business in the ring. I believe that then I believe that now, but I did take a good ass whip. China really gave it to you. Uh, triple H is going to attack you before the bell. And then Steven Hunter brawl all over the building. So that leaves China to really work you over for an extended period of time. You even take a pedigree from her until eventually yeah. that Jeff- hurt too, boy. You know why it hurt Connie? She wasn't look at her heels. Yeah. She was not, uh, in, in good balance. Right. And she apologized to me profusely after the show for that move, because I, she drove my face right into the canvas because she got off balance. Right. And uh, she was very uh, empathetic about that. After the show was over, she gave me a big hug and you know, Hey, isn't what are you going to say? I don't worry about it. I'm all right. So, uh, but it helped get the spot over, help get her over. And that was all that mattered. It was just getting her over at that point. What I was doing. I was booked, I was booked to be her, you know, punching bag. And I'm fine with that. That's not a bad role to have. I got paid. Well, yeah, I was guessing did the payoffs. That'd be you, me. <laughs> well, later in the show, we see Austin throw triple H in a room to meet one of his friends, a real rattlesnake. Oh, and they play up on the next show that the snake had bit triple H in the face and he has a makeup job done to look like it. But it was all a ruse to get a sneak attack on Austin before no mercy on pay-per-view just three days later. And this is not long after Russo had left the company. Uh, and at the no mercy pay-per-view triple H is going to keep the WWF title. It's a no holds barred match where he's going to pin Austin after rock would interfere and accidentally hit Austin with a sledgehammer. When triple H moved out of the way that of course costs Austin the match. Uh, so when you think about it, we never really got to see. Austin rock Hunter fully play out, but it does set up a big pay-per-view survivor series in November. As we all know, Austin is taken out of that match because he was run over with a car. They hit him with a car and uh big show is going to take Austin's place in the match and win the title. And that's really the, uh, the end of Austin's 99. These neck problems are flaring up to the point. He's going to need extensive surgery. He's not going to be able to wrestle again for nearly a year. Uh, this is a, a tough time in his career. And I'm sure you were his, um, sounding board at times during this era. Is that fair to say? Uh, my theory is you don't bail on somebody 
especially a friend. Yeah. Any, anybody in, in our locker room that I was managing, uh, you, you don't bail on those guys when the times get hard, especially as don't call Steve Austin. And so people can say, well, JR is just saying that cause they were buddies. True. I'm going to deny that. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm proud of that fact that Steve and I have been great friends for all these years. And, uh, and so, you know, if that's a penalty, then I guess I'm off sides. I don't think so. Did you think Austin thought at the time he had wrestled his last match? He had, to, he had his days where he thought it was over because the thing he was not going to do was to come back and not be stone cold. Right. And he was, you know, very proud of his legacy. He had made a lot of money. Uh, he saved money. Steve's very financially secure, even to this day, but he was uh, smart with his cash uh, because, you know, he's, he was just an old wrestler. He's right. a, he was a territory wrestler that made it big. And, uh, so he was very smart with his cash, but there were times when he thought that maybe it's over. Maybe I, my body just won't hold up to my own standards. Mm. And that was his conundrum. Well, let's talk about the, uh, the transition here, you know, the timing couldn't be worse or I'm sure we, we had big plans for what was possible with, with Hunter and Austin. Yeah. Uh, we never really get to see it all play out. Maybe the way we would have hoped. Um, but still the business is hotter than ever. Austin's probably had a record year financially here in 99, but man, at the end of the year to be on the sidelines. You know, these neck problems. I mean, we saw before just over the summer, the knee was a problem and now the neck mm -hmm. we can work through some knees. We can get those Forrest Gump knee braces, like you were saying, but Lord, the, uh, the neck, man, this is a real threat and we yeah. know he's going to be able to return and I can't believe it. But as we're talking, he was in last year's WrestleMania. We of course are in WrestleMania season. Now, were you surprised to see that he's not at least as of now scheduled to do anything at this year's WrestleMania. Well, it just tells me that they haven't come up with the right idea that makes him happy. Right. He has to change his philosophy. Right. If he gets offered a spot on the card that, uh, and I, I think he should be booked personally, but that's just me. Uh, but if he's not booked, it's because, uh, WWE didn't come up with the, an idea that he was high enough on to take the plunge again. I don't ever see him. I can see him being booked. I can see him doing an interview. I can see him giving some stunners, drinking some beer, but I can't see him having another match. I thought his match with Kevin Owens uh, here a while back was really strong. Kevin Owens is a hell of a hand without a doubt. So, uh, uh, anyway, I, I just think Steve was, you know, he, he wasn't. He wasn't sure what the hell was going to happen. And I think that caused a lot of, and I'm not a psychologist, but I would say Conrad, that, that, uh, depression mm -hmm. was an issue because how do you yeah. not, I, I suffered it strongly after three bouts of Bell's palsy, right. in the course of those journeys, God dang, I, I, you know, I, I was lucky. I had a good wife because she kept me, my head up. Right. And, uh, cause there are times there where I thought. I'm never going back on Vince McMahon's television show with facial paralysis. And thank God I healed enough to, to suit him because he's the only one he had to suit. It's his, it's his ball game. So I had no problem with that. So he was no different than Bill Watts or anybody else I worked for. So that's, that's how that, that's how that, that washed out. So, uh, but Steve was, we, we talk regularly. And, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes we didn't even discuss wrestling as a matter of fact, sometimes I, and he and I both without saying it, didn't want to talk about wrestling, right? Both of us being big football marks, you know, he came to, he, he came up to Oklahoma and spent a weekend with me in Norman and I took him to, to an OU game, put him on the sideline, all that good stuff. He loved it. You know, when you, it's a great atmosphere when you're, you're surrounded by almost 90,000 people. And man, he, you talk about, I think it was invigorating for him because here's a bunch of football fans that he's, I gave him some OU gear to wear. So he's wearing some OU gear. Uh, and I think he was overwhelmed by the reception that he got from just normal people. 
and he was, he was that guy. He was the every man and they, they showed their love for him in a very unique environment. Hell, he was getting cheered like crazy. We left and went to our suite. This did not be more of a distraction. So, uh, I, he's, uh, so we had a lot of, we've had a lot of good times in that respect. I remember where we ate. I remember where we sat. Uh, I remember staying at my house, of course. And, uh, so he's more than just a talent. And I think some people could make an argument that I've made a mistake by getting so close to the talent. And I highly disagree. I think the closer and the better relationships you have with the people that report to you yep. in any walk of life, the better off you are. It's that simple. Well said, we got a lot of questions. Let's get to one here. Alicia wants to know over on Twitter. Uh, what was the plan for stone cold, Steve Austin at WrestleMania 16 that he missed out on due to having neck surgery. Of course, Wade speculated that perhaps it was supposed to be Paul white, the big show versus stone cold. Do you think that was the plan? I, I don't know. I don't know. That didn't sound right to me, but it could be, it, it, it could be, it's feasible, but I don't know for sure to, uh, confirm it. Uh, but it could have happened. I, it would not have been, you know, Steve, Steve, uh, I don't know what kind of chemistry Steve had with show. Uh, I think it was all right, but I don't know where we were going with that deal. Well, I know where we're going this Friday. Tomorrow is St. Patrick's day. Why not celebrate St. Patrick's day this Friday with us over at adfreeshows.com. It'll be jam packed. Seven new pieces of bonus content. Our lucky seven will be bonus episodes with Eric Bischoff, Jake Roberts, a new ass Conrad, and a whole lot more. And you can try it on us right now for free. Wow. You see, we're actually doing a one week trial. You can check it out at adfreeshows.com. And what you'll find is you get ad free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts each and every week, starting at just nine bucks. That's adfreeshows.com. By the way, if you haven't already, let me just tell you, if your business targets men that are 25 to 54 years old, you've probably figured out there's no better place to, add to than to advertise than right here with us. Uh, we have a very targeted audience, so there's very little waste. And that's the reason you see the same companies advertising year after year after year. Check it out at advertisewithjr.com. You can also see some of our new swag and merch over at uh, grillingjrts.com and grillingjrshirts.com. We've got tumblers and little plush dolls and hoodies and cutting boards and t-shirts and something for everybody. But the real main event, especially as it starts to warm up, and spring is here. It's grilling season, baby. And there's right. something for everybody at jrsbbq.com. If you haven't already, I want to recommend the hot sauce. I recently tried it. I loved it. I'm not a regular consumer of hot sauce, but buddy, I don't miss a day. Anytime I've got protein on the grill, you can bet your bottom dollar. I got JR's all purpose seasoning on it. And my wife absolutely loves the main event mustard. I know, uh, old grill and JR's producer here, uh, bull Ramos. He loves the Chipotle ketchup. It's more than just barbecue sauce, something for everybody at jrsbbq.com. Yeah. We appreciate everybody's business. We sincerely do. And, uh, I got a text or not a text, a tweet the other day that somebody said on Twitter, listen to this, that they were on our site and that after they were on the site for a couple of three minutes, they got a, they got a, uh, a notice that going forward, that if they stayed on the site any longer, it was going to cost them two dollars or something. I don't know how the hell that got. I don't. I don't know what that uh, is. That's it's not, not us. I can tell you that it's not us. You know, I, I said this, and, and 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 now it's more applicable than ever. I guess. Uh, you know, looking's free. Costs yeah. nothing to look. We said that forever on this show. Yes. So, uh, but we appreciate it. Father's Day's coming up. Give that some thought. We're we're shipping out goods every day, every day, seven days a week. Our staff crews working hard to keep up. I made a major purchase the other day of some, we're going to have some, uh, I, I made a major purchase of some, a bunch of JR's action figures, right? Ooh, there you go. And I'm going to sign them all. When we get them in, we're going to, they're going to be, a, it's an item that is available for signature. I don't, I don't think we're going to customize them because there's just so many, 
but I think I'm going to sign, uh, they'll give me a good excuse to go back to Oklahoma and spend the weekend and sign the action figures. So, but we got specials coming up all the time. So sometimes when you got nothing to do and you got a couple of free minutes to, to jump on the site, just jump on to see what's new. Just ju- and, and we appreciate you, uh, registering with us because all that means we're not going to sell it or share it or anything along those lines. It's simply a way for us to communicate with you. And when we've got special, special deals, we can put that on this uh, mailing list and you guys are the first in line. So, and it costs nothing. We're not going to sell the damn thing, as I said. So, uh, JR's, uh, barbecue.com is the spot to go. Appreciate your support very, very sure. much. JR's BBQ.com is the place to be. If you haven't already go check it out. I'm telling you, you're going to be glad you did. And I'm glad we got to hang out today and talk about Stone Cold Steve Austin's incredible run in 1999. Uh, we've got a big show planned for you next week, though. We're going to be talking about WrestleMania 14. WrestleMania season is upon us. It's another big win in Steve Austin's career. The Austin era begins. But before we get there with him and Shawn Michaels, we've also got Kane versus The Undertaker, their very first match. Pete Rose is going to make his WrestleMania debut. The Rock versus Shamrock, Sable's in-ring debut, the incredible dumpster match between the New Age Outlaws and Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie, and so much more. Talking WrestleMania 14 next week here on the program. By the way, if you didn't see the video yet, you got to go out of your way to check it out. It's one thing to hear the show. It's another to see it on YouTube. It's totally free, and we've got lots of little clips. It's an excellent way to introduce the wrestling fan in your life. Uh, to grilling Jr. Check it out. It's grilling Jr. on YouTube.com. How easy is that? Hit that subscribe button. Grilling Jr. on YouTube.com. Uh, that's it for me, man. Greatly appreciate the time today, Mr. Ross. And looking forward to hanging out again soon. Me too, buddy. Me too. Thanks, everybody. Don't forget. Uh, normally watch uh, Rampage on Friday nights on TNT. Again, I'll be not there. You know, it was uh, as I said earlier when I fly in a pressurized cabin, which they all are, you, my foot swells up like a can, a, a cantaloupe yep. and it hurts. And to get to Winnipeg on this particular routing was three flights. Wow. And I just couldn't do it. So I hate to, I don't mind admitting my weakness. You know, hell I'm 71 years old, man. I pull a piss and vinegar, but golly three flights. And that's, and I'm not knocking the company is you can't get there from here. As grandpa said, you can't get there from here. Right. So, uh, I'll be watching on TVS as I'm sure many of you will guys have got this show early. Uh, you are, you know, you, you are reminded, you know, what's going on. So anyway, things are good. Conrad always enjoy chatting with you. Always. Yeah, it's good. Our show's doing great too, folks. We are, uh, downloads are good. You know, we're, we're just clicking right along. So tell a friend about what, what we do here, please. And maybe they won't, uh, categorize us and stereotype us with other podcasters because Conrad's experience and preparation in my almost 50 years, uh, in the business can't be equaled. And that sounds very egocentric and I, maybe I meant for it too. I'm not sure, but I really believe that uh, our show is unique and can't be replicated because who's going to bring this knowledge and are still our passion. I don't know why I still love wrestling as much as I do, but I do. Yeah, it's, sir. It's, it's a good time to love pro wrestling Conrad and you guys can help us all by supporting Conrad's ad free network. And I got a little piece of business on there here, there and yon. So it's all good, man. But anyway, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate you very much. Your loyalty means a lot. It's, it says a lot for you. And, uh, so again, tell a friend about our show and maybe that we'll get, we'll continue to build these ratings to uh, amazing heights. So thanks again, Connie. Thank you, buddy. Have a good week. Good luck to the crimson tide. Thanks man. We'll be watching and we'll see you guys next week right here on grilling Jr. with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. See everybody. Take care. Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here. And just want to call a quick time out. I want to tell your listeners about what I've been telling everybody at over 83 weeks, quite a while now. About all the cool things that are happening over at AfterShows.com. The wrestling wars are heating up as David Crockett and Conrad revisit March of 1985 on The Book. 
Vince has brought WrestleMania 1 to life, while Jim Crockett Promotions is preparing to be back on TBS television. And you got Dusty Rhodes and Tully Blanchard on top, Magnum TA and Ivan Koloff for the U.S. title, $5,200 at the gate. And meanwhile, while that show's happening, WrestleMania is becoming a thing. And uh, the wrestling wars are about to heat up because just one week from now, you guys are back on TBS. Former WWE executive John Filippelli sits down with Conrad on an all-new edition of The Insiders and discusses his tumultuous relationship with Bruce Pritchard during his time with the company. Vince was trying to, I think there were times where he tried to sort of get us to try and work together better than we were. And I, I was quite candid. I was quite candid about how I felt about him, about that I didn't appreciate you know, him undermining us or me. And I uh, I would have no part of it. And I told Vince, if he doesn't straight his act out, I don't want, he, he's got to go. Either he goes or I go. Ad Free Shows members recently got to chat live with the enforcer, Arn Anderson and hear stories of legends like the late, great Bobby the Brain Heenan. Sharpest, funniest, wittiest guy there's ever been on this earth. I could look at Bobby and go, hey, Bobby, you got a bump on your neck. Before I could get neck out of my mouth, he had to come back. Boom, boom, boom. And just hilarious. That's just a small thing.